Today we're going to start looking at a second school of moral thought called teleology. And what we're going to find out is that, um, as we talked about last time, teleology is um, quite different from deontology in that deontology, as we've learned, takes a look at the moral goodness of uh, certain kinds of actions. And it's the goodness of those actions that become the uh, measure of morality, or in other words, the actions themselves become um, are good, and that goodness is uh, the measure of what is good. The teleology, on the other hand, as we've talked about last time, takes a look at the consequences of those actions and uses those consequences in order to determine if those actions are good. So with teleology, consequences matter. Okay, And again, teleology is in, um, because of that, teleology is quite different from deontology. So, let's take a look at some uh, tenets of tele teleological ethics and uh, take a little closer look at what they're all about. The first here is that uh, consequences of actions determine the goodness of those actions. And so, in other words, what results from an action becomes its the moral measure of that action. So in other words, if we do something that's good because something because something that we did was good, then the action that produced that result was then good. And so again, this is in opposition to deontology, which of course says that you know certain actions are good or bad by their nature, whereas with teleology, what results from an action determines whether that action is, its, is in fact uh, good or bad. And as we're going to find out here when we take a look at different philosophers, uh, we need to carefully assess the results of actions in order to determine how good they really are. Okay, It's going to require us to give some considerable thought to the results that we've produced and to assess how good those results are in order for us to be able to say that the actions that produced those results are good. So we're going to take a look at our first teleologist named Peter Abelard. It's a nice picture of him. And uh, what Abelard believed is that in classical, as a classical teleologist, what he believed is that actions themselves are not inherently good or bad. Okay. If we take a look at actions in and of themselves, they are, um, for Abelard, more or less morally neutral. Okay. On the other hand, though, what Abelard said is that intentions can be good or bad. Okay. So by referencing it, intentions here, what Abelard is getting at is that by intending to do something, we are attempting 
to bring about a given result. And because we intend to bring about something, that's a direct reference to results. And that's why Abelard thinks that it is intentions that should be looked at in terms of their morality versus actions in and of themselves. Now, all this sounds real good. Uh, it sounds pretty straightforward, quite logical. But one problem with it is that it's sometimes hard to know people's intentions. And this is particularly true, of course, in a social context. When we see someone do something, it's hard for us to know what it was that they intended to do when they do something or when they did something. And that becomes a bit of a problem because we don't know what people intend and we can only assess what people do based on what we see them doing, uh, we, based on what their actions are. So that is a bit of a problem here. The other problem is that uh, it's sometimes hard for us to know our own intentions. People are oftentimes delusional. And we often do things uh, without really fully knowing what our intentions really are. I know myself that I do things and I find myself catching myself and asking, well, what is it you really want to do here? Why are you doing this? And um, as you yourself might know, it's uh, sometimes difficult to answer that question. So again, the second problem here is that it's sometimes hard for us to know what we are intending to do. So that's Peter Abelard. Next we have uh, Niccolo Machiavelli. Some of you may be familiar with them uh, or with his philosophy. It's uh, pretty well known. Uh, what he believes is that we can sometimes do bad in order to do good. Okay, So if we want to bring about a good action or a good result, sometimes that may require us, and I have to emphasize the word may require us, to do something that might ordinarily be considered bad. So what he says here is that the ends justify the means. And that's really the key feature of Machiavelli's moral philosophy, the ends justifying the means. And so in other words, if the ends are good, in other words, if the consequences of an action are believed by us to be good, then the means we use to bring about those results or, at, or that result are also good. Okay, So that's what he means by the ends justifying the means. He also believed in what he referred to as the ungolden rule, or as he put it, doing unto others as they have done unto you, okay? So, in other words, if someone does something bad to me, well then, I can take the liberty to do something bad to him, okay? Some uh, people have interpreted this to mean that you can take... Um, some form of preemptive action. So in other words, uh, if I believe that someone is about to do something bad to me, well then I can preemptively do something bad to him or her. Okay, It's really unclear as to whether Machiavelli really meant that 
most people understand the ungolden rule to mean that we should do unto others as they do unto us, which of course is in direct opposition to the golden rule, which specifies that we should do unto others um, as we would like them to do unto us. Okay. And finally, we need to understand here that by saying that the ends justify the means, Machiavelli isn't more or less giving us a blank check to do whatever we want, provided that the ends are good. Even Machiavelli, I believe, would place some guidelines on our behavior in that he would ask us to really have a clear understanding of what the ends are that we want to bring about and also a clear understanding of why um, those ends are good. And he would ask us of that, he would ask us uh, that, or he would ask that of us to have a clear understanding of what the ends are. So it's not something that we can enter into um, casually and just simply say to ourselves, oh, well, you know, yeah, I think the ends are good, and so therefore it just, those ends are good, um, and therefore that justifies me being able to do whatever I want in order to bring them about. That's not necessarily the case here. Okay, So I think it's important to remember that even Machiavelli would place some guidelines on those... Um, principles. The next teleologist that we're going to be taking a look at is Immanuel Kant. And Kant believed that we should at all times act as if our action should become a universal law of nature. So in other words, before we do something, we should ask ourselves this. What if everyone were to do what I am going to do in this particular situation? What if everybody did that? What would we have? Or would that be okay? Would it be okay if everybody did what I'm going to do or what I'm planning to do in this particular situation. And that's what he means that we should act as if our actions should become a universal law of nature. In other words, our actions should be universalized across everybody in this particular situation. Okay. And that's known as universalizability or as it's more well known as the categorical imperative. The categorical imperative. And that's probably what Kant is best known for, the categorical imperative. But the categorical imperative here again means that, you know, we should act as if our actions should become a universal law of nature and uh, otherwise known as universalizability. Okay. Now, just like we saw with Machiavelli, Kant would say that before we act, we need to give this action some considerable thought. Again, this isn't something that we need to enter into lightly, the whole idea of acting as if our action should become some kind of universal law of nature. What Kant would ask is that we use the power of reason to think carefully about our actions and about if they really should rightly become universal laws of nature. And so really what that is is a reference to the use of reason. 
Next, he emphasized moral agency. The whole idea that we are creatures of action. That we are wedded to action. That as human beings, we must act. In other words, you know, we're, we're not rocks, we're not inanimate objects. Like other animals, we must act. Therefore, it's incumbent upon us to think carefully about how we act. And so that's Immanuel Kant. The next person up on our list is uh, an individual who I'm sure you've probably heard of before in some of your other classes, and that's uh, Mill, John Stuart Mill. And as you may well know, John Stuart Mill is probably best known for his embracing utilitarianism, first made popular by Jeremy Bentham. And as you may know, utilitarianism refers to the idea of doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And so this idea of doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people is, is actually quite elegant, simple, and uh, straightforward, really, in its approach. And it's known as the greatest happiness principle. Okay, Voltaire, who we took a look at when we looked at the deontologists, said that the greatest happiness principle um, was an immutable law of nature. Okay, that it's really the only moral principle there or here. And Mill uh, certainly subscribed to that, okay? And calling it the greatest happiness principle, what Mill is essentially saying is that the greatest good for the greatest number of people is really the only moral good, okay? And that's why he refers to it as the greatest happiness principle, okay? Um, now, as we've seen, Mill would also say that, you know, this is not something that we should kind of casually consider. What he asks is that we need to have a correct idea of what the good here actually is. So when we talk about doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people, we need to be clear to ourselves what the greatest good for the greatest number of people really is. We need to have a good idea of that, and we need to have a correct idea of that. Because if we're not careful, we can end up thinking that we're doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people, but in reality, uh, we're not doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people, okay? And so again, we got to think carefully about what the greatest good really amounts to here, okay? And what Mill would ask is that we need to remove selfishness from the equation, or we need to remove selfishness from consideration here. And that's really one of the first criteria of determining the greatest good, um, that needs to be considered here. Because if you think about it, if we remove selfishness right off the bat, if we remove or try, or try to remove our own vested interest in what the greatest good amounts to, um, then we'll be on the right path to being able to correctly appraise what the good for the greatest number of people really is. Next on our list is Emile Durkheim. And uh, Durkheim has been called the father of cultural ethical relativism. 
And cultural ethical relativism, by the way, is something that has been criticized quite extensively by the Catholic Church, as you're likely to see here a little bit later on uh, in the course of class. Um, and more recently, most recently, uh, it was Pope Benedict who um, made a number of pronouncements criticizing uh, what he referred to as widespread cultural ethical relativism or rampant ethical relativism um, and looking at that uh, with some disdain. Okay, But what that really means, as you can see here, is that um, cultural ethical relativism is all about the idea that culture itself determines right and wrong. And culture itself dictates what is right and wrong. So morality here for Durkheim comes down to uh, what culture deems it to be, more or less. And it really stems from the idea that for Durkheim, culture can't be divorced from morality. They're intimately related. They're intertwined with one another. And that's why he says that um, culture and morality can't be separated. Because when he takes a look at morality, when he takes a look at what is good and what is bad, he wants to say that there are very, very few ethical absolutes. He might say, well, you know, we all know we should not kill, and we all know we should not steal, and we all should know that we should tell the truth and be honest with one another, um, those sorts of things. But he would also say, though, that um, those really constitute a significant minority of decisions that we're faced with. And so what he's getting at here is that 95%, let's say, of the decisions that we're faced with or that we make in any given day don't necessarily deal with ethical absolutes. And that's why he has recourse to culture here, because he wants to say that in the face of that, we need to look at culture to help tell us what is acceptable and what is not. And so what we see with that, though, is that if we depend on culture to help tell us what is right and what is wrong, well, that could be problematic because culture itself, the culture that we're depending on to help us sort through all this might be bad in and of itself. And probably the best example of that um, would be Nazi Germany. If people living in Germany at the time of uh, the Third Reich believed what their culture was telling them, then they would be led to do many things that were bad. And we saw how that all played out. So one significant criticism here of cultural ethical relativism, even though it would seem to be uh, alive and well, and it surely is alive and well, because you yourself might think of choices that you've made where you've thought about what people think to be acceptable and not acceptable, even though it is widespread and often used, um, it can go bad. It's not without flaw. And so the final philosopher we'll be taking a look at in teleology is uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. And... You might have heard of him before, just like you've heard of uh, Mill or Machia Machiavelli. What Sartre is 
probably best known for is his whole idea of existentialism. Now, we're not going to be going too far into that because, as you might know, existentialism itself is an area of philosophy that is incredibly wide, incredibly deep, uh, quite complex. But what we're, all, what we're going to be taking a look at here, though, is how existentialism relates to morality. And that's why we're going to be taking a look at what uh, Sartre has to say about that. Now, just like cultural ethical relativism with Durkheim, we're going to see here that Sartre's idea of morality seems to be quite common. And you might recognize yourself having made decisions using existentialism, just like you might have uh, you might recall yourself making decisions appealing to cultural, ethical relativism. Okay? And why I say that is because with, e with existentialism, Sartre believes that, um, well, like Durkheim, that there are no moral absolutes. And so what Sartre asserts is that morality is what we make of it. We write our own moral codes of conduct. And so that's how existentialism plays out in morality. In that we create our own ethical codes. We create our own guidelines for conduct. Okay. And the main reason for that as part of existentialism, is that, like Kant, who emphasized moral agency and the idea that, we're con uh, that, that we uh, must act, Sartre similarly believed that we are, in his words, condemned to freedom. We are free human beings. We have the ability to make choices. We have the ability to make our own choices. And so in that respect, we're free. And that's what he means by being condemned to freedom. And so like Kant, uh, Sartre would say that we must act. We must act because we are free. And because we must act, we act. <laughs> and in the process of acting, in the process of making choices, by our very nature, or by the nature of making those choices, we ultimately end up writing our own moral codes. And these moral codes that we develop for ourselves are very flexible and highly situational. And so, for example, you might even relate to this yourself of bending the speed limit on occasion when you're driving. Or if you find a pen laying on the floor, well, you just might take it. Okay, um, those are some very simple examples of what Sartre is getting at here. And so by doing the things we do every day, we make choices. We make those choices because we are free, because we have to, because we must act. And as we make those choices, as we live our lives, we are really making our own moral codes. We're setting up our own moral guidelines. And so what do we have left here? What are we left with here in the end? Well, what we have here, I think, is one common thread. One common thread stretching from all the philosophers who we've looked at today with teleology, 
all the way through the philosophers who we've looked at before who are deontologists. And that common thread that I'm referring to here is choices. Because really when you think about it, whether we're considering deontology or teleology, whether we're talking about Aristotle or whether we're talking about Abelard, what we're dealing with here are choices. And in my mind, that's really what the study of ethics really boils down to. It's really the study of how we make choices, what criteria we bring to bear in making choices. And that's something that we have to deal with as human beings, is thinking about how we make choices. Okay, And so what we're going to see as we move forward is that um, that's really going to become the common thread here once again. And that throughout our time together here in class, we're going to be taking a look at how people in the media make choices. What kind of criteria they appear to bring to bear in doing the things that um, they're doing. Okay, And, you know, like we've seen with deontology, sometimes people are going to make those choices simply because those choices are the right thing to do. Just like a deontologist would suggest. A deontologist would say that, well, there are some things that are just the right thing to do. And they're the right thing to do because reason tells us that they are the right thing to do. Okay? So sometimes people are going to make choices using deontology as the guideline. And on the other hand, sometimes people are going to make choices because they want something good to happen. Okay, They want something good to come about. And that, of course, is a reference to teleology. Sometimes people are going to make choices based on results, based on the good things that those actions would bring about. And, of course, when they do that, again, they're going to be making that choice for teleological reasons. Okay? So that's our look at moral philosophy in information ethics. And we're going to be going back to these philosophers, whether they be deontologists or teleologists, quite frequently when we take a look at different cases in the media. Thank you.